we've heard a lot this morning already about lack of involvement, uh, lack of mobilization in many countries uh, in Europe, East and West, and this may well be a solution. Whether it's the panacea uh, remains to be seen. Um, and um, to guide us in this uh, and moderate uh, this panel um, is uh, Mathieu Le Pedre, who will moderate our discussion. And as I said, we have workout groups, and then we'll come back here um, later on. Um, and Mathieu has also kindly agreed to moderate um, the, the, the feedback or what people come back from the, from the working group. Um, we're very grateful for Mathieu to do this. He's very experienced. He currently is the executive director of the New Cities Foundation. Um, a non-profit organization that incubates, promotes, and scales urban innovation. He very much uses these kinds of technology, but previously he also worked for the World Bank and in the UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations, serving in Afghanistan as well as the Middle East. And Mathieu has been both a close observer and, more importantly, a strong supporter of the School of Public Policy ever since we started off. He moderated one of our leadership maps, given all the tremendous experience that he has had in large organizations, but also in his movement and currently in the Lucidic Foundation. So, Mathieu, I'll hand over the floor to you, and thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much and for, for having me and, and, uh, and for the discussion this morning. That I thought was, uh, was extremely interesting and so very interesting from an outsider's point. I, I'm French. I'm Franco-American, but I'm French. And in France, we've just gone through a slightly traumatic uh, few weeks with uh, municipal elections in France and a similar landslide to the right, including the National Front. So it was very interesting for, for, for me to listen to the Hungarian spirit. And if anything, uh, it's nice to see that uh, our fellow Europeans are dealing with same problem, if not yet the same solution, um, all over Europe. Um, and uh, the, I thought the second panel was also very interesting in, in, in the response. And so what we're going to try to do is to explore um, sort of an, an emerging uh, field, um, which is um, referred to here as, as digital democracy, um, uh, which is basically looking at um, how the advent of the ubiquitous, in, ubiquitous internet um, and the fact that in this room there's probably 150 devices that are connected to the world, and how potentially that can that, that can play um, as as to, to help roll back the rollback. Um, let's start by by well, first of all, we have a, a really great panel of of, um, uh, of people who have a very rich uh, experience. So we're gonna uh, we're gonna focus a little bit of our time in the first part of the panel on hearing from them. So they will not just make very boring opening statements, but I think they will make very interesting, uh, very interesting stories about some of the, the, the work that they have all, all three of them have been doing in this field. Um, and so uh, I, I won't introduce the panel uh, in, in, in great depth because you've got their bios in, in your in your in your books, but I really think that we've brought together three people from uh, all over Europe, uh, from Berlin, Amsterdam, and London. Um, to, to talk about some of these examples. Let me first start by saying that um, even though we're going to talk about the future and technology and so on, I think it's worth looking and starting this talk by looking into the past a little bit. I think democracy um, it has always been in crisis. If anything, democracy in the last 200 years, but certainly if you look at the 20th century, has had seven, eight major episodes of crisis. So I think I would start by saying that it's probably not a good idea to think that this crisis has been taking for you. I mean, certainly I think the First World War, democracy was in crisis after the Second World War. The financial crisis is just the latest in a series of crises. I mean, if you look, if you read, uh, you know, Tocqueville and others, I think their hope in democracy was based not in the fact that it was going to avoid crises altogether, but it, that it, it's a pretty good system that has bouncing back from crises. So, where I am hopeful and enthusiastic is that um, we will get out of this, um, as democracy has always gotten out of it. It's complicated, it's, it's hard to do, but it, it, it does happen over history. And so, 
have truly preserved this topic um, we're going to explore here is one of the questions that we should look at, all, all, all three of you should, should have to examine is how digital democracy um, and these alternative approaches uh, do offer opportunities for this particular balance back. Is the advent of, uh, we're going to talk about online participation, we're going to talk about political narratives, we're going to talk about population 2.0, is this whole group of topics we're going to explore going to be part of both how we bounce back from this particular crisis. So I think that, 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 that will be um, interesting um, to look at. Of course, given the fact that we're supposed to be the participatory panel, and, you know, you know, we will make this highly interactive. So please start thinking about your questions, interrupt me, and interrupt our speakers. Feel very strongly about LinkedIn. Use Twitter. I will check out my iPad, not to check my email address. But I'm going to play on Twitter. And we will start uh, using technology, the technology that we used uh, this morning for some, for some very light uh, voting questions. So those of you who do not have a voting machine, uh, you might want to get one because there will be a couple of, um, we'll, we'll do four, we'll do two now and two a bit later on in the discussion. Uh, turn them on and please don't start the clock because I saw a lot of people being very nervous about not getting their votes in time. We don't want to be anti-democratic. Um, okay, so her question is, how many times have you taken political action in the last month? Political action can be a petition, a demonstration, a political, whatever you think is a political action. And you've got five answers. One, between two and five times, more than five times, more than ten times for the super political action, and then zero. So you can go now.
trying to work with the internet in terms of democracy. So um, I think I was I'm probably one of the um, probably the youngest digital native here because the first time I was on the internet I was like seven or eight in 1993. Um, I was really privileged and um, I just used it as an information channel um, to ask questions. Although it was not really easy because first it was in English and I was eight. <laughs> And second, the internet was not that full of information back then. But I realized really quickly that it's um, a huge opportunity to connect people and to give people the chance to um, speak their mind and to kind of trying to find a, a consent or having a rational discourse. So um, I started, I founded a state. Uh, I tried to um, think about how democracy can work with the internet because there are some problems. For example, there is no um, no election. Uh, there is no election possible because it's not possible to do it. What's the word? Um, yeah, e-voting is uh, not. I forgot the word, I'm sorry. So you, you can't do it without people, you know, um, you can, sorry. You can have an election online uh, with your hidden name. Yes. Anonymous. Yes. Okay, that's uh, kind of embarrassing. <laughs> like, what do you like? oh. Yeah, it is. Uh, so it's not, a, it's not possible to do it anonymously. So this is, for example, a problem when you consider the German constitution where it says explicitly that it has to be So I thought with friends and with other people about how can we deal with that, how can we assure that it's still a democratic election, that it's still kind of anonymous, kind of free, kind of, you know, equal. And but we get some ideas about like self-control within some within defined groups, and so on. Um, and then I started um, with the Pirate Party. I don't know if anyone knows about the party. Some people are nodding, OK. But I know it was not, but not anonymous, it's fine. Um, so we, I found this group, and they, I, I realized a lot of people have the same ideas, the same um, wishes, the same um, visions about using the internet to um, make elections more dynamic, more easy, more flexible. And um, the party adapted the idea of liquid democracy. Has anybody heard of that? <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. So it's basically a system where people can put um, text um, and uh, bills or whatever you want to call it, and then people can vote on it. So, but as you know, it's, it's not possible anonymously. So, it's um, you can see how the people voted on each topic. You have different topics, of course, as it is in politics, uh, environment, security issues, and so on. And the interesting thing is that first, you always know who voted for what, but in terms of issues, not in terms of elections. So um, this is in a political party, for example, it's extremely interesting because you have a record, a voting record. Um, and then the second uh, thing about um, liberal democracy is um, delegation. So you can delegate your voice if you don't, you know, if you don't have any idea about environment. Um, you can delegate to someone you think that actually has um, enough background and enough knowledge. So what happens is that we have a flexible representative system based on the internet and based on, um, well, based on the idea that you can not know everything all the time, but that you can choose the person who will present you and your idea or issue, and you can always withdraw it. This is basically representative democracy, but in a more flexible way. Um, and first I was really 
I was really passionate about it. I thought it was a, a great idea. But of course, as it is in politics, people start fighting. So the question of anonymity and whether it's really a free voting when everybody is always able to see a record came up. Um, issues about privacy, issues about whatever people come up with, it's not, you know, you can manipulate it and so on and so on. <coughs> so this is the reason why the Fire Party in Germany, for example, has been fighting about this topic for five years now and still not have like a solid system. Um, but on the other hand, it was a, there was a problem with too much pe like people getting power, like super delegates in a way. I don't think it's a problem. I think it's actually a good thing because it's transparent. You can see who delegates from the room. Um, and so on. So, and uh, we started to or we wanted to use the system within the party, but a lot of problems came up. So the participation, for example, was the first problem. There were issues uh, voted on by 70 people. The Fire Party had, at, to some, at, to, at some point, 40,000 members. 70 people to 40,000 members, or 30,000 members, that's a problem. Um, then, of course, a lot of, um, there was no, um, it was not binding for the people in the parliament the Fire Party already has in Germany. And so on. So it's like this idea of making democracy more flexible and trying to break through this static parliamentarian um, industry, I have to say, um, is actually quite promising, I think. But the problem is still that there are still people using it. So that means the bills or the taxes within the system are not always of good quality. Um, sometimes they have like, they're really just poor quality because people are just writing stuff that sounds good, but they don't think it's true. So populists have some kind of, have it easier in the system, potentially, um, which doesn't mean that, well, on the other hand, there are the delegates for that to kind of filter that. But if it's like not um, a paid politician that is a delegate in the system, it's in the free time. So the person who has maybe a lot of knowledge about the issue mm -hmm. still has a problem that um, she has to do it in her free time. And uh, same problem again, quality issues. Um, and then, of course, a lot of people think it's not um, accessible enough um, because you need a computer um, and you can't use it on your smartphone, for example, because there is no app for it and so on. It's like a really developing pro a progress or developing a process that you can't really, that a lot, like a lot of people are standing in the way of it. So this, I think, um, from my experience, a huge problem, the Fire Party Germany had the idea of liquid democracy in 2010, the system is called liquid feedback, and it's still not running, it's still not working. Um, there have been some um, programs developed within the system, but it's not really working. Um, so it's a, to some degree it's a disappointment that people actually don't really want to be in the process of democratic decisions um, to a high degree. Um, that means that you still have like a small percentage of people that are actually using the system, actually working, um, and we have the same problem as before, um, like the dictatorship of the activists, um, in a way. So, because in the Paris Party in Germany, there is this saying, who the one who's doing is right. So if you do stuff, you're always right. Um, which is, of course, a problem, especially when we talk about right-wing uh, movements, when we talk about um, fascist movements. Um, so there is a variety of problems that comes up that liquid democracy and the idea of digital democracy is promising, but right now, for me, I don't see that it actually
actually will change something for the really better. Because it's not, I don't think it's not about the way we execute democracy. It's not about the way we come to decisions. It's about the decisions. So yeah, let's get it. Thanks for that. That was very, very interesting. Uh, I'm going to ask you if there are any clarification questions or points specifically about the examples of the Paris Party, because then when we get into more general discussion, I'm not sure that you all have a good understanding of the case studies that are pointing to that. Yeah. So, any clarification questions about Julia's experience? And, uh, before I hand over to, to Tim, and I think uh, Julia, thank you a lot, because I think you've touched upon a lot of really interesting uh, topics that are true for all of the you talk about. Um, you know, the dictatorship of activists, you talk about the poor quality of the text, which I think is very interesting. Before I turn to you, Tim, I, I want to thank. Uh, that 
that I particularly am involved in doing now, which is the online um, social movement building. I got out of, I spent six years in conventional politics, I was running for specialized I was very involved in the backroom politics um, in uh, where I grew up in Australia. Uh, but I consciously, and I was very much on the track to get into the parliament, but I consciously chose to get out of that track and to work in this field of building new social movements. Because I really felt often from the inside of politics that even when we wanted to do good things, in a sense, we kind of lacked the social license, we lacked legitimacy because we didn't have, you know, a, a public that was engaged and asking for for our issues to act. I think that's often missing piece. Um, and I think politics in in Europe, by and large, is even more elitist and even more closed to outsiders and less engaged with the public um, than where where I uh, grew up. So I, I want to share um, just five thoughts from and uh, reflections from the social movement building work that, that I've been involved with. Circus is a it's a business, it's a social business, it's a, it's driven not by profit but by really social impact and works across the field from gun control movement in, in the US to poverty, to environmental issues, to LGBT rights, human rights campaign, um, global south sort of more. So it has a diversity of, of, of voices. Um, so five five reflections. Um, one is in terms of developing movement thinking, thinking in terms of building movements rather than just talking about issues, engaging people, we need to we need to think about the narrative. We need to have a narrative. We need to answer the question in simple terms: What's wrong with the world? Why have those things gone wrong? Uh, and what's the solution? And how can I be a part of it? And I think the right answers those questions really well. I think if I ask you what's the obvious message for example, I think you can ask that question. If I ask you what the message on the side of the left is, then answer that question, I think you get a lot of confusion. <coughs> and it's true in part that it's a world of conflict. But we need to have simple messages. We need to have narratives that answer that those big picture questions. So that's the first thing. A big picture story. Um, secondly, we need authentic voices. You know, when we started working on uh, the minimum wage campaign for fast food workers in New York, we didn't start with the messages of union leaders. In fact, we didn't use them at all. We took a woman who, a uh, single mother, lived in a homeless shelter in New York. Because even though she worked full time for McDonald's, she can't afford a place to live in New York. She's authentic, she's real. In an era where people are, you know, sick of the robotic machine politician, it's the authentic work in the real people that come through. And to some extent, and when we build social movements, you know, we look for those authentic voices. So it's not that, you know, they don't have a lot. You do go and look for them. But that they are the forefront, not the charismatic leader, but the real people. And it's a real switch in time when you, when you, you change the voice from that sort of top down to the much more bottom up. Thirdly, in thinking about movements, Build them around people's identity, not around the issues, not around the facts. You need to think of people's experience as a member of a movement. You think of how can we get people saying, I am part of this, you know, I'm part of the rights movement, for example. Um, why did that happen in this in America? People didn't just link to the issues about disenfranchising African Americans from an abstract issue as a point of view. They felt they were part of something that was about changing the world. And that's a big shift. It's not about membership. It's about personal identity and being part of something larger than yourself. It has to be with your, your agency, your capacity to do something useful that can make a difference in the world. So the fourth thing is it's about action and participation. It's not just about facing a problem, a campaign, but you always think about how, how what's the entry point for somebody who's never done a political how do we bring them in? And that might be in the digital world, it's very much <coughs> in terms of life, you know, it's recreating something. Um, but there's a journey to take people on. You don't leave them in that world, you encourage them to step into offline action so that they join something in their community, they initiate something, they have an outside. So when recently we were building a movement around um, the what we call the peer economy, the sharing economy, that new model of the, the Ubers and Airbnb and uh, Kickstarter and so on, which is really exciting new opportunity for people to take control of their lives. 
life of your job to make money and so on. We started that movement called Tiggers, which you know, put a million people in this corner. Mm -hmm. um, we started with them saying, have dinner with kids. You need other people in your neighbourhood who are like you are trying to build something for themselves and using the opportunity of this platform. So it's all about that. It's all about thinking about participation mm -hmm. and, and action and setting people for an increasing level. Of, um, of involvement. <laughs> Finally, this has been, um, it's about diversity in the capital community. Don't just do the same old thing. And in the online world, that's also don't just do the same old petition that these people do for the last 10 years. So just as, you know, don't do what in the 1960s was really radical, the street march. But I mean, grandpa's doing the street march, right? So, I mean, it's not particularly interesting and there's an awful lot of people, it doesn't grab any of your attention. Do something that's a bit more savvy, that has a bit of rebel energy in it. So, for example, mm -hmm. the movement that we got going in Rio, which is a sort of a citizen participation anti corruption movement in um, based around millennials in Rio. So, they're campaigning on a sanitation campaign. It sounds pretty boring, and how do you get people excited about toilets? <laughs> but what they did recently to sort of engage interest and get people involved was take a bunch of toilets on the beach, Coast Cabana, and they just had a lot of young people, good looking young Brazilians, um, sitting on the toilets on the beach, tweeted these messages, these uh, pictures, got into media all around the, the country and in fact internationally, and put a spotlight on the fact that half the city doesn't have access to sanitation, yet it, all households have had a tax, and the money's going into the pockets of political parties to run campaigns. Corruption issue, but they made it interesting. And there's lots of ways in which you can turn you know, all this business into something more interesting. Using some of those sort of digital tactics. And not doing the same thing all the time, right? So changing your decisions around and so making a bit of fun. Um, so that's five ideas. If we have a moment a bit later on, I might um, uh, show a, a, a video. Great. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll just say that we're going to be So I, I, this can be a this can be a moment for audience participation. So because I know this time of the afternoon is quite handy, you know, to put things together. So the choices are I, I've got one which is an example of how uh, a, a, a video that helps to shift the debate around marriage equality in Australia um, out of the sort of minority rights frame, the gay community towards um, a bigger story of, of, of love. Um, you know, see. Or the other one is one that uh, we did in, in the US around money in politics, and it was to take the position of a congressman um, who and make him into like a, a guy in, in the Pac Man, if you remember the, the computer game Pac Man, going gobble, gobble, gobble money, um, and capturing the, the way in which money is struck with politics. So, can I get a show of hands for the American Party? American Party? Or the uh, uh, money in politics. Do you want a higher voter or no? Still what? Money in politics? Money in politics? Hops. Hey. Table. No way. Tom Farley is exactly wrong. Before that, one of the things we had in America was France. And that wasn't very American at all. We all know the Constitution those guys drafted wasn't perfect. We've had all kinds of important stuff. Yet, over time, we've come together to improve our Constitution. And today, 220 million Americans have the right to vote. But, after decades of political corruption, our votes don't count quite like they used to. Right before our eyes, they're being outmuscled by another form of political power. Money. These days, if you want something in Washington, it's a surefire way to get it. Throw a congressperson in front of it. Political candidates are expensive. 
Really, it's better than Martin. Politicians are desperate to get their hands on the money they need to pay for their next campaign from staying off. They know that 94% of the time, the candidate who raises the most money wins. So they spend up to 70% of their days chasing cash instead of running the country. But junkies will do anything to find a fix. And only a handful of billionaires and big special interests put up the big bucks. Over 80% of presidential super PAC money has come from just 196 people. The way our system works, special interests get what they pay for. That's why pizza is now considered a vegetable in school cafeterias. Why three of the country's top ten grossing companies paid zero federal taxes in 2009. And why certain industries have enjoyed a 77,000 percent return on one particular kind of investment. Their lobbying dollars. The friend is like so long. But two years ago, it got worse. The Supreme Court decided a case called Citizens United, making unlimited anonymous campaign donations the law of the land and taking our democracy from flaws the fixable to creating some parity. Before Citizens United, we could at least identify the people who were pumping cash into our politics. Today, we don't even know where half of it comes from. It could literally be anyone. <laughs> <laughs> and our politicians represent the money that banks owe them, not the people who vote them into office. They mean us. They don't represent us. Next you want those guys who invented America were around right now, but the they, they wouldn't sit on the sidelines and watch. They'd raise hell. So that's what we're doing. When the rich try to buy our lawmakers, when politicians sell out the lobbyists, and we'll continue to make noise until politicians blocking reform are booted from office and unlimited anonymous campaign donations are things of the past. We may not have billions of dollars, but we do have millions of people. And when we come together, we can ensure that our votes count exactly as much as they are supposed to. The Constitution is pretty clear about this. It's we the people, not it, the money. If you want your democracy back, join us. And if you don't, don't worry. We'll get it back for you. Great. Thanks for watching. That's a great, great part. I make a group. They are very expensive to keep their food for us.
to uh, tell how the uh, in groups and uh, well, the end uh, it's not that important, but uh, like, uh, I, how I am doing it. So what has happened really is that uh, a number of people, uh, quite ordinary citizens, started up a number of Facebook groups uh, with all kinds of missions, all kinds of funding, so that they're feeding uh, various groups, Facebook, uh, Facebook groups. And uh, one, of, one of them suddenly blew up. And the fact that the, the group name is on there for the freedom of press blew up in terms of uh, likes. Numbers, but just a few chances. Uh, but it acted as a lightning rod. It, it was able to channel all the growing dissatisfaction and discernment in the sense for the first act. Uh, and it stopped in terms of growing. It grew around to that 100,000, now it's in 140,000, but it never grew big, never grew uh, more than that. And uh, I'm really curious, I'm really curious why we are not able to really go beyond that 100,000. Uh, and I have a number of, uh, a number of answers. And uh, one of those answers uh, uh, just contributes to my decision to leave this country. Uh, and that is uh, uh, very much connected to the topic of the uh, discussion uh, this morning, is why, what happened. And we have today in the country is that the limits, uh, there are very strong limits. This is my, my take on the issue. There are very strong <laughs> limits uh, to civil society in this country. There is very real tradition uh, uh, for that. And there are very low respect for very fundamental values which are necessary to, uh, uh, for our civil society to operate. The respect for autonomy, respect for self government. Respect for the freedom of one, of one's own freedom, and the respect of others' freedom. And, uh, and the level of uh, an active involvement uh, in the lives of the smaller and wider uh, uh, community. Uh, so, what we see now, uh, or what we have seen yesterday, or what we have seen in the last four years in Hungary, uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult thing because I think that what the government has done. In the last four years, uh, it's not the code that we need to tackle. It's not the problem that we need to solve. It's just a symptom of the underlying problem of a society being there and not being there. Uh, in 2011, in one of the first uh, uh, mass uh, protests, I gave a speech uh, where I said uh, that I'm really happy for this very repressive and aggressive. Uh, Today, uh, the government decided to uh, deregulate the media uh, because I, 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 and I argue uh, that this gives us, Hungarians, or us as a political community, the chance to access the real value of media, the media issue, and whatever is happening to the uh, constitution, the court, the independent court, and every other uh, democratic institution. Uh, gives us a chance to think about how much we value these institutions. Well, the last four years uh, have a very bad, uh, 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 a very bad message uh, because it seems like uh, nothing has been taken that has any real value, at least for those people from whom the institutions were taken. Uh, and uh, so the question is not how do you roll back uh, the destruction of democratic institutions, how do you build a uh, civil society that is able to defend uh, those kinds of institutions and those kind of institutions? And that's a much more trick, a much, a much trickier question. Because in the last quarter of the century, we have all, all of the old and all of the old conditions. Uh, favorable conditions that were there for civil society to go and flourish. We have a very favorable local regulatory framework. We have a mild local and global political environment. We have a, 
so so that's that's the issue. Uh, and uh, how how does uh, technology uh, feed into that? Uh, we had uh, you know as a researcher, I, I had a, a certain field of professional needs in India around the year two thousand, and then uh, the the message or the, the belief we had was that this technology is having immense 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 authority power uh, and if people had access uh, to these tools uh, this is the Californian ideology then good things uh, will happen but this is not the case uh, and what I can uh, tell from my experience is that there are layers and layers of infrastructures that work upon each other all necessary for a uh, for a good campaign to work, for a good democratic uh, uh, institutional environment to work. And what the, in the in the very basic level we need to think about this guy. Right? Yeah. When I see those very fancy uh, videos, you know, I, I say to him, we can we can do something about that. But what we don't have, have we can import these fancy uh images and uh the uh the kind of time span and the nice record. But if there is no one uh there is there is a constitutional tradition, so there is not a very strong civil uh, engagement uh, behind it in the environment that witnessed it, then it may or may not uh, work. And then we play at this level of technology, I think. <coughs> and uh, that's another issue. Uh, digital divide is the next layer that we have to cross, is that uh, even if people have access to digital technology, they are not using uh, in the same way. And, uh, uh, we had a, we had a uh, uh, survey done, and it came quite clear that uh, uh, in terms of media use, uh, there's a huge share of the population that has a very conservative and very poor, uh, poor uh, media consumption profile, there, which means public service media, radio, and nothing else. Uh, and there is a very small segment of very uh, highly innovative, highly digital segment of the population, around 100,000. Uh, uh, again, who uh, were actively consuming all kinds of media, free media, digital media, uh, 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 broadcast media, uh, who we can reach uh, using very digital technology. Uh, that's, that's another layer. Then there's a third level, right? Uh, all around that. In the digital environment, if you know, if, if I have to accept the outcome of yesterday's election based on my Facebook feed, it affects people's percentage uh, vote. And I'm, and I'm trying to maintain a, 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 a story consciousness in my Facebook feed, but it's very really easy to understand that math is very right. Uh, uh, yes, it, and I, I, I'm not aware of the segments of the society. Right? I would like to add another layer, a technological layer, on top of the social part. And that is the algorithms uh, these intermediaries are using to select the news for us. Uh, we were talking to uh, uh, the, uh, the representative of Facebook, who is responsible for the political and uh, civil Facebook groups uh, for the region. And we were trying to uh, extract information from her how. Facebook algorithm uh, classifies news feeds for individuals. How do I know that anything that I post on constitutional freedom uh, reaches certain people? Uh, people? How does it not reach certain uh, others? How does it work? And it's a totally black box. We do not know how these algorithms are constructing the different types of public spheres that they are used to in the in the broadcast. So and, and the Confusing question, and uh, that layer that we celebrate in technology as a layer of connecting people acts as an insulator. I'm insulated as a Facebook movement from the 100,000 people, um, and I have no way uh, to personalize that. I think that's the main thing. I would like to add another layer to that, uh, and that's uh, what uh, uh, an artist friend of mine. Uh, uh, Formulated as the merciless phase of the human flesh. How we convert political activism in the digital space into presence in the news space. How do we convert 100,000 lives into 100,000 people in the street? Uh, and this is a straightforward campaign. It's not, it is not. How do uh, uh, you cross those borders between virtual and physical, between highly connected uh, information and and digital 
towards the SCP faculty. Uh, this morning we learned about how uh, difficult experiences in Hungary uh, fall on public opinion about the democratic institutions. I wanted to see if you could say something about Snowden and uh, the UK uh, joint task force that was pushing the public opinion over Twitter, the US ad, and Twitter's use of Twitter as a project that involves the democracy manipulating. Um, 
um, because mostly, you know, that's a more uncomfortable thing to do, being in a sort of setting with things like you. And as you say, the tool of others is very right? Like we all put people to the right now. But if you can push people out, that, that, can, that can grow, that can expand that community. And that's where I think opportunities are the same. So that's the best way to make nasty friends on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, apart from the fact that you know you have to deal with people that you get, um, I probably say I would love to see um, money going into it and really developing a system that is accessible, that is um, usable, because. Although I made it like the fun of it, as I said, well, people who said it was too hard to handle, it is not as easy um, as it is because the digital divide, for example, comes into it with people that have a different background and as a white European academic, it's pretty easy for me to say, well, this is pretty easy. So um, I would like to see that there goes money into it and that there is really the chance to develop um, an open source platform um, that really works and that can be used and that people like to use. And I think, well, there is, I think there's some part of gamification missing. Although gamification has its works, I, I can see that. But since it's pretty much capitalistic, IBM is pretty much um, not really, you know, it's kind of pretty sprinkled on the problem. But I feel that if there would be um, a system that is usable, that is easy, that at least people try to, would try to use it, and it would be more easy, and that could at least motivate some people to deal with the ideas and behind it. Because, I mean, if you have the private party as a not really representative group of people. Um, people that are in the internet, have been in the internet forever, and have been part of developing the internet, um, have been part of the open source community and so on, and even they don't like it. So I think that's, uh, <laughs> or they don't want to use it. So it's like, if you even have this group that actually is the group that is the early adopters, probably the best. And they can't connect with it, it's that difficult. So I think, um, and a lot of you know, working groups should be supported to uh, work on uh, developing this idea. Yeah. Uh, do you want to answer maybe the point of view? Yeah, that's very quickly. Uh, Thank you. 
enormous benefit for the uh, for the college. Uh, and they are very big and very efficient to destroy all those benefits. So surveillance, uh, I'm, I'm interested of surveillance, is happening and it's happening for the uh, uh, targeting, uh, good commercial and political targeting of messages has been made uh, quite easy and very uh, and efficient. Uh, monetizing the capitalizing on, on political return. This is what Facebook is doing, right? They are selling, they are selling uh, goods like us uh, uh, the package so which you can buy in so we can read uh, or follow it. Uh, and they don't care about the political return since they just interested in the bottom line. Uh, so uh, this, this is happening and this is happening much cheaper uh, and much more efficient. Uh, then uh, any bottom-up uh, uh, efforts to use the democratic processes to uh, come forward, and that's that's an issue. Uh, and uh, and it comes to on both uh, both during the elections, I had a chance to to be in the U.S. and uh, Obama was re-elected, and after that, uh, a number of uh, people who are working in the data analytics team uh, arrived to uh, the working on the lab for MIT. <coughs> And they were telling their experiences, what kind of situation they run uh, uh, during the election. And it's a different function of how data uh, driven uh, targeting then uh, won the election for the uh, But the, the, the same technology that helps him to win helps him to get away with everything else is not really right. It's the same technology that is able to measure how to address a certain uh, part of the network. Is able to measure for, for them what are the issues they can get away with talking to one or to the drone board. Uh, and, uh, and that's really targeting both uh, in the democratic black, black, black first election process and in how how we can practice uh, 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 use of information. <laughs> Great. Thanks a lot. Do you think maybe that the 
that we have reached peak digital in the way that peak oil and that we have reached peak digital, partly because of NSA, because of Snowden, because of privacy issues that people are saying, well, I took already my data away on marketing stuff and whatever, buying books, and now I also took my data away on political campaigning, and they will tell me, um, this is what you will be voting next time, and this is what you will be doing politically actively. You don't need to be involved anymore, we will do it for you. Um, so, uh, are we a little bit behind the curve when we're talking about this? Amazon, uh, we all we read about Amazon's predicted delivery one of the most horrifying thoughts that Amazon starts moving your coffee machine or your socks before you even turn on your computer. By by, well, eventually by drone. But the, the scary thing is that they know what you're going to buy before you even buy it. Okay. Oh, oh one here? Yeah. And right. please introduce yourself. Good day. I'm Jan from the European New Parliament. I should like to say that I'm represent my country in charge of the region. Um, you were surprised by the large share of people here who didn't believe that digital technology, um, you know, represents hope for democracy. I was one of the people who said that, and the reason for it is that I think, you know, so together in life, um, retweeting things, and you're trying to get 100,000 people out of the street for one issue. It just makes sense. It's way too simplistic, way too easy, way too simple. I do believe, I mean, believe it or not, I think in party politics, I know. Things that take years when you go to meetings and you take minutes of those meetings and it's probably in five years, etc. I have to think that's a great thing. Because I think political issues are way too complex and way too complicated to be decided by, you know, whoever gets the same great example of life and papers, for example. Um, probably makes an old boy in the sense of just saying, Yeah, no, I think that's a very interesting point that there's a term in the field called political liberty. Uh, let's take one last one, all the way to the back. Thank you, Ramon, and I was also an activist in Romania for Romania and Black Freedom from beginning together with all us. And when we organized the first big demonstration, one of the slogans was, uh, like it offline as well, so come to the demonstration, not only like it. So isn't it the case for us and others as well? That's why uh, organizing, communicating, or working people on the internet are not saving us. If we don't have a vibrant civil society, uh, but even with the case that it is actually helpful. So it gives us additional opportunity if we are proud enough it and if we are putting in enough work. So it, it's just easier. And then of course those who would like to push us back they have these opportunities as well, but we have at least these organizing tools that we wouldn't have had several years ago even. Thanks. Ellen Hill, just to you. I couldn't let the uh, panel pass without a quick intervention. Today is uh, Roma Holocaust Remembrance Day. And I just wanted to put that out there so that we don't end just a negative note about that. And secondly, I wanted to pick up a humble quote uh, just to, to help us wrap up in, in a more positive way. Uh, and that is that uh, Havel also said to us, it's a man who became his biographer, uh, told us this at a Havel conference last year. He said, Havel said, was asked, how did you bring down communism in Czechoslovakia? And he said, we did what we could. And when we did what we could, we found we could do more. So we did more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we've got four questions. One big umbrella for, for issues. Uh, how do we reach peak digital in politics <laughs> and the relationship between modern and politics? 30 seconds and to stay in brief, and then we'll try to do one last round. Um, one
you said before, the California ideology, ideology that kind of combines this freedom and hippie thing with liberalism and capitalism. And I think that the internet gave this, um, or the development gave this um, a new drive. And this is done. So we know that although the internet is there, there's still um, the there's the private ownership of means of production. There's still the capitalistic side that we have, and um, the problems will not go just because we connect to each other. And I think um, what also is seen is that a lot of people really don't care about the NSA. Um, a really a lot of people really don't care because they have other problems. Um, they have economic problems. They don't care whether some random dude in the end of the day reads the email when they have to, you know, survive. So I think this is this is actually a good term. Um, and the other thing I want to say about the um, like slowing down politics, which is actually that's the old idea of Mark Freeman, like bureaucracy as slowing down stuff. Um, and I think that's true in a way that the communication, the way we talk about politics, and the way we talk about the issues, is much more, it's with much more people, and a much more people talking, it's, it's much more transparent, much more open than 20 years ago, which is maybe a good thing, but on the other hand, the politics are really, um, they are hunted by information, by new development, and of course, the um, media as, um, also an industry that has to sell commodities as an information. So I think this is a, this is a basic conflict. And I think, of course, the internet and social media make this even harder. So it's like a lot of politicians are hunted by a, an army of squirrels, kind of. And I think that's the problem. But I have no idea how to solve that. Well, do you want to answer any of these? Sure. So to jump on to um, Francis's question about um, the umbrella, uh, I think the key thing is there is a skill that we have lost, particularly in politics, which is the skill of the organizer, the person who's got the capacity, not to form committees, but to go to people one on one and to fire them into a plan, to a strategy. It's a really rare um, skill. It's so powerful when you see it happening. And it's actually in the digital age, of it's even more important than ever. And get people more <coughs> into an initiative, a campaign, get people working together, same direction. Um, so my fight for organizers, second question, the other question about um, the, the flowing of politics. I think the answer to this about the criticism is, and, and not wanting to get sort of too um, academic about it, but we need to go back to, in a sense, the Marxist analysis or the Sol Alinsky, the great community organizer, and think in terms of power structure. The great projects of progressives, I think, is not about the distribution really of money, which is distribution of power. And we have to understand the world in terms of the reason why there are power injustices, is the power is distributed in an uneven fashion, centralized. The opportunity of new technology is not to just to do the click, but it's can we change the power structure. If we think in those terms and if we educate people in our movements, we give them a larger story that this is just the first step and what we're really trying to do is we're trying to kind of change the um, power structure. I think we can then, we, we can use the, the, the tools in ways that are, that are impactful and are about long-term change. Okay, very quickly, um, we are very far from thinking the same way that the French are what traditional politics have been talking. And to, to, to uh, respond to that, uh, I, I have a very nice quote from the United States Immigration Commission, uh, published a very comprehensive report on the uh, immigrants uh, at the end of the, uh, the 19th century. Uh, and this is what they uh, wrote on uh, uh, US immigrants uh, from Hungary. Uh, 
don't know, I go between, you know, how much that needs to be a national voice, each person owning that, each country owning that, um, or how much that can be. And I think the answer is probably the combination of the two. On, on the social movement building, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm very sympathetic. It's a grand plan to rebuild social movement. This is probably shorthand, and maybe I suffer from being in the living in America too long and the kind of, you know, the glib marketing language. Maybe the better way to say is to try and contribute to the social movement. To try and do one part of what you have is the online part of that. Um, you know, it ultimately goes back to my point before about what we're trying to do is build power, build people's sense of when my voice joins with Julia's voice, joins with Philip's voice, joins with Matthew's voice, in some way we become stronger. And when all of us join together and stand up and say, this can't be, we've got to change things, then somehow the sum is greater than the, than, than the parts and we can change things. And that's the, it's, that's the, the heart of what I think we need is that sense of giving people agency and to have a sense of agency, I think we at least we start to overcome the crisis of, of apathy in, in particular the people who like that had up Julia, did you want to add a comment and maybe just draw up a picture for me to include these people? Um, yeah, I'd like to say that um, well, it kind of goes to what has been asked, but not really. Um, because I feel that what um, what we now see or what we now can actually um, understand and research is that um, there is no truth in language and there is no truth in communication. So when you say go back to the core values, I mean I have talked to fascists of every color that are arguing with basic values. Um, and they really are convincing, you know, when it comes to, for example, anti feminist. Um, when they say, well, it's about equality, but they don't consider the real power situation, they don't consider the situation of women, and they don't believe in any kind of time. So it's hard to. Um, appeal to values if they interpret them completely different. And I think this is what comes kind of to the question about the same language. It's not only about culture background, it's not only about um, some nation, and it's not about countries. I mean, it's actually it's insane to still hold on to nations in the, in, in the world uh, or in the world that you're living in. Um, but it's about um, horizons, and it's about um, understanding and as um, I'm really um, in favor of um, the like, definition of Shijek when he talks about ideology that it's, it's a frame and um, how you um, how, how you perceive the world and how you deal with facts and how you put facts into your world into your ideology and I think what we see right now is in the end and I feel at least that in the past our party in Germany was in a like in a nutshell. It's an ideological war, and it's about um, the question: what is truth and what is not truth? And we can see that in the U.S., for example, there has been a, like a, a war on on science for a long time, and in Europe it started also. Um, and I think that um, the good thing about the internet, I feel that um, what I like about the internet is that it makes that visible. You can now see how people try to argue against um, gay rights, against women's rights, and so on. And they really, they don't have any, some of them just don't have any kind of anything. Like it's just, or anti Semitism, as you said today. Um, that it's a, it's a huge thing. And I think that we can see now. Um, how you know how messed up humankind actually is, but I think it's a chance. Although maybe it will be bloody before, but you know sometimes they have to go down further. Thank you very much. Just, uh, just and and a little bit more. Thank you very much. Very good. This I thought was fascinating and super exciting by the by the perspective. Um, 
the drill handle. Uh, I will end with if I ask you this question. Do you know how many toothbrushes there are in the world? <laughs> Any number? How many toothbrushes? Anyone? Any toothbrush <laughs> you want, so I will not. So there's two billion toothbrushes in the world. I think we have, you know, not in my house, we have about 17 of those. You know, and they're really poor. Um, uh, and how many mobile phones are there in the world? The answer is 6.1 billion mobile phones. So it's not as if technology is, no, do we want technology? It's here. And there are quite as many mobile phones as there are toothbrushes. Um, so I, I, I share, I don't want to end on that note of, of optimism to say that you know, it is a very exciting time. Clearly, there is still a risk in every single um, And I want to thank the panel very much. And I'm told that I have to tell you that there are workshops 